Hey, everybody. Welcome to Old Fashioned Catholics. I'm Nick. I'm Kevin. And we are Catholics who drink old fashions quite often. Um, mm. We are just two friends, married men with kids, uh, trying to do the best we can. And we usually film after 11 p.m. because that's when our wives and children are asleep, or at least tentatively asleep. And so uh, that enables us to kind of meet up and do this. We have found that our show is best enjoyed if you have a beverage to sip on. So if you would like to push pause now, we're going to put the cocktails that we are drinking up on the screen. Uh, so you can try to make one of those. Even our guest, his, his list will be up on the screen as well. And so we'll just pause right now. And welcome back. Um, so the guest tonight uh, wanted me to shorten his bio, so I will shorten his bio. The guest tonight uh, works at the, he's on faculty at the TOB Institute. He is a content provider at the TOB Institute, um, and he is stellar. I'm, I, can't, I'm, I'm, I have little chills. I'm very excited to have him on tonight. So uh, without any more biographical ado, I welcome to the show Mr. Bill Donahue. Thank you, Nick. Awesome to be here. Hey, Kevin, good to meet you virtually. I'm honored to be on the show. I'm pumped. And I've never had an old fashioned. Well, yes. actually, two okay, hours so ago, that's I had actually, my first, so, so this is my in, second. <laughs> in every show, we, we only ask two scripted questions the whole time. The first is always, what are you drinking? So, Mr. Donahue, what did you, what did you make? Okay, so again, I, you know, I do, I do, I enjoy a good scotch. I enjoy a good Irish whiskey. Um, so, but old fashioned, never heard of it. So I went with the classic Maker's Mark. Okay. Which you can't Excellent. go wrong. And then I, I did the simple syrup. So there's that. Okay. And then I found this exotic Peshaud's aromatic cocktail bitters. Yeah. And we had one mint leaf in the fridge. So I grabbed it Ooh. and muddled it and threw it in what? there. And um, also some Cracker Jacks from a box I found under the kid's bed. Just kidding. The Cracker <laughs> Jacks are not in there. Now, 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 brothers, I put it in my St. John Paul II mug because his feast day is tomorrow. So you can't see the amber gold and beauty of it but because it, it's St. John Paul II's feast day tomorrow. He's proud. He approves. And in our family, it's a solemnity because we have two people who have his, his oh, namesake. So I started awesome. celebrating right now. <laughs> that's awesome hey it's the, that's it's the visual. well and actually in a prior episode kevin and i actually that was a question we asked is have you ever what have you ever drank out of a coffee mug before so here we are that was prophetic yeah. it was didn't take long yeah. Yeah. prophecy fulfilled there you go well, well, and well, partly, you have to so, you have to i was gonna say nick just real quick you have to tell okay. us at you know, the, after your second old fashion your thoughts on it um, now that you have, you know, two under the belt, if it's yeah. a drink you'll make again, or if it's oh, one yeah. that you can just kind of throw away or what? Oh yeah. I'm digging it. I really am digging it again. I, I, am a fan of bourbon and scotch and, uh, the idea that you can throw like fruit, like cherries, orange peels, uh, you know, kind of a sangria meets, you know, good bourbon. It's American. So one of the things Kevin and I have talked about, so there, and there's like the, the Bible of cocktails um, on the front, it shows you can flame an orange. There it is. You can flame an orange peel. Wow. Wow. So you squeeze the orange peel over a match and it spritzes onto the drink. And I thought it was stupid. I thought it was like, Oh, way to be kitschy. That's so I'm not going to buy that, but I tried it and it 100% changes the entire taste of the drink. You wow. get this burnt. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. So if, if you ever come on again, we will just, we will decree, we'll do the burnt orange just to be that, you know, I don't know, hipster or whatever it is. We'll all, burn, we'll all flame our oranges at the beginning of the video. Same time. And then yeah, we'll pause to put out the fire and then start <laughs> off again. Um, but it, actually, so he had joked about having Cracker Jacks in there. When I first invited him on the show, I was like, okay, so we, if you're okay with it, we always do an old fashioned. And he was like, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'll, I don't know what that is, but I'll do it. And I'll probably... <laughs> I probably plan on grinding up a Snickers in there if that's okay. <laughs> and I was like, it's my dark Irish humor. I'm, you know. Yeah, definitely. So I was talking to him yesterday. I'm like, well, so I did see at the liquor store, they do have like, you can get chocolate. I have it right here. I have it. Oh, here. You can get peanut butter uh, whiskey Ooh. from Screwballs yeah. and you can get chocolate whiskey. And so people mix them. And he was like, Nick, Oof. I was kidding. I was like, oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, was, I knew it that. Was, it was a joke. Yeah. It's yeah. a joke. Things but you know, who's to say it could be amazing. It could be amazing. Yeah. That's how Reese's peanut butter cups were born, right? That's right. Two great yep. tastes that taste great together. 
Yeah. So we'll, maybe we'll, next time we will all have to just grind up. We will use a muddler and we will muddle up a Snickers. Muddle it up. We're not nice. going to do that. We're not going to do that. <laughs> we'll use something really neutral like vodka and we'll just figure out what types of candy can we crush in it and drink. Yeah. There you go. It's oh like Cold gosh. Stone, but for alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And so then the, the only other question that we have that is scripted and then the rest we just get to talk um, is because we do, you know, where I am, it's 10.06 PM, but where you are, it's 11.06 PM. We, yep. we purposely film late at night after anyone in their vocation has had their full day of living that vocation and all the stresses that go along with it. Um, and so we, I, we always like to ask, because it actually does matter, and because, especially somebody like you who has a very public persona, um, we just like to ask, truly, actually, how was your day today? How was oh, your day man. Like? Well, you know, you know that feeling when you're leaning back in your chair and you go a little too far and then you catch yourself at the last second? Uh -huh. I feel like that all day. Okay. <laughs> just kidding every day or just bad. today that was it's, depressing yeah well no it's exciting the adrenaline kicks in you know we have um it's a roller coaster ride i mean it's you know i i'm a lecturer and educator for the institute so i'm teaching john paul II's beautiful theology of the body uh it's been lately zoom meetings but we do international work national work traveling uh but then i come home and live it with my kiddos my four beautiful kiddos and um it's you know it, you hit the real right and it's just uh it's exciting it's crazy um never a dull moment actually rebecca and i often pray for dull moments we're like lord today could we have some dull moments <laughs> <laughs> yeah he Please. hasn't answered that prayer yet but it's it's fun <laughs> it is fun that's awesome that's okay so how many kids do you have so we have one in heaven grace elizabeth and we have four on earth we have seth ryan who's 12 uh claire grace who's 10 sheila grace who is seven almost eight and Kagan Matthew, who's four, almost five. And I always joke that that's the hours of sleep that we've gotten down to I've, I've, it's a, <laughs> yeah, four hours a night. It's, nuts. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I should, a, I should, well, I should say, so uh, Bill and I had, I, we've met once technically we've kept in touch yeah. for years, but we met that's once right. we were speaking at the uh, Arkansas men's conference and, mm -hmm. um, and actually, so neither of us had spoken yet. I had seen your stuff a ton and I knew you, but like on the poster, I was, I was like this big on the poster <laughs> and, and it was, and that's fine. I like that. Cause I can just scoot in and no one knows like, Who, who's this dude who's this guy why are we low, letting him low drink? expectations yeah. equals high yeah. happiness high happiness yeah. Yeah. so uh but we were at and i don't i don't remember who it was but it was um we were at somebody's house in the neighborhood the night before because we had both flown in and right. we were standing by a fireplace and we both had a guinness uh and guinness if i don't like any beer but if i drink I'll drink Guinness because Guinness is not a beer. It's, it's something from no, God. No, it's not. It's, it's different. So, <laughs> it's and, the eighth sacrament. It's right from heaven. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said that and you work for the Institute and I'm okay with it. It's fine. <laughs> but so we're standing there. I still remember like we're standing in front of this fireplace and we're sipping and he's got his and just introducing ourselves um, and kind of chatting and looking around at a ton of people we don't know. And then um, my phone went off and I, I got the text and I looked down and it was my wife and I have permission to tell the story. Um, the text just said, I hate you. And I went, <laughs> and I just went, Oh, okay. And he, and Bill, you said, what, what happened? And I was like, Oh no, I just, my wife just, I just got the, I hate you text. And, and Bill, he looks at me and he says, Oh, um, I've only been gone 13 hours. So I'll get mine in the morning. I was like, what? <laughs> what? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I travel, my wife's like, you're never doing this again. You're ruining yeah. in the family. Yeah. Like, and right. I, I, I truly can't tell you, like for me, truly, truly, truly. I mean, it, for real, how many times in my life I would be before a speaking engagement and I'm getting it to go up and speak on like the purpose of life and theology mm -hmm. and all these like things that mm -hmm. are grand, but they seem really grand in the moment too. And then my wife would just text me and be like, you're ruining everything. Just so you know, have fun at that talk you're going to give. And like, <laughs> I felt like I was the only one Enjoy your Guinness. To, to have, yeah, to have you just be like, Oh yeah, uh, mine's coming. Like it was just really refreshing to me. Um, and because at that time, I think you had three adopted children and we had just That's adopted right. three children as well. So there was That's a, right. That's a right. similarity there. Um, do you, uh, we don't have to focus on our wives hating us. Do you have, uh, are you okay talking about the adoptions? 
Oh my gosh, I love it. Yeah, so all four of our kiddos are adopted and including our, our one in heaven, Grace Elizabeth, we're a fully adopted family. Yeah, so it's a real melting pot. We've got uh, Irish, Cherokee, African-American, Belize, we've got everybody. Um, it's a beautiful mixture, especially in these days. It's beautiful to have such a, a wide palette, you know, of color yeah. and ethnicity. Um, it's kind of powerful for our world yeah. right now. So for you guys, um, did the, like when I met you, that was three, did they all come at once or? No, no, work? it's, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. So we had a stretch of years of infertility and just, you know, you kind of feel the ache, feel that ache for a while. You can't, children are a gift, right? They're not a right, you know, so you can't get graspy about it. So we opened up our hearts. We were in that ache for a number of years and then the gift started coming and it was every two years. So our kids are all two years apart, except for Kagan's oh, okay. three years. Yeah. Kagan's three years apart from Sheila. So it's almost like what we probably would have done with natural family planning, right? You space it out by a couple sure. of years. So in the Lord's providence, that's how it rolls right now. They're all about two years apart. So For, um, you're, oh, go ahead, Kevin. I, I just wanted to say, um, would you, for people who are listening, yeah. um, care to elaborate on what you mean when you say children are a gift, not a right? And what, what that means to yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. That's, I mean, here we are in a culture where um, we're such a consumer culture, right? And it's sort of like instant gratification. I want this. I get it now. Um, download it like quick, fast, fast, fast. And we really slide into this like utilitarian way of like, like children, like, Hey, it's not working. Something's broken. Oh, you can do this thing real quick. Just Google IVF and you can get a, you know, with sensitivity to those who sure. maybe haven't heard the full backstory of what IVF is and what it does. Um, we don't have a right <laughs> to children. We have a right to property, a right to bear arms. Like you, children are people, right? Persons, and this is so John Paul too, in our Catholic faith, people are a gift. Every person is a gift. Therefore, every child is gift. And the moment you try to grasp at that and say like, well, that's my right, it just messes stuff up. And you know, when Rebecca and I were going through the infertility, the years of fertility, um, you know, people, would, you know, hey, you know, you could do this, you know, and you could have this procedure done and you could have your own. That's like, uh, I, and we thought about the scripture passage of, and this is wild, right? Abraham and Sarah, and you go back, what's this, like 4,000 years ago, where it's the same exact struggle. They want a child and Sarah, um, Abraham's wife, right? Give me a child. Take Hagar, my maidservant, and sleep with her and give me a child. And that grasping idea of like, I deserve, like, this is my right, screwed up literally all of human history and, and set off, you know, the family of God, the dream of God of unity into this diversion, this, this uh, bifurcation. And it's because we couldn't wait for the promise, right? So you wait for the promise, wait for the gift. And it just, it lands better, right? It sits better because it's God's plan. Um, sure. Not to say you can't feel, you know, the anger, the ache and talk to God about that, be raw, be real, but, yeah, we've just discerned, like, you know, if you try to grasp and, and take too early and not wait upon the Lord, it's going to mess stuff up. Well, you so, think about that with any part of, if, if, if you self-analyze any part of human life that you just take, never mm -hmm. goes mm -hmm. well for you or anyone involved. Never. And none never. of it. I mean, as married men, all three of us are married men with multiple children. Any time in your life, whether it's with your wife or with your kids, that you just flat out just like, no, I'm... This is my time. This is my bat man cave. This is my whatever. It it's never, never satisfying. Yeah, it never <laughs> breathes life. It never, it never hits what you're aiming at. You know, it reminds right. me of Hamlet. He says that I have shot the arrow over my house and I hit my brother, and like mm -hmm. that's what happens every time. Like you're trying, you're aiming, but you end up har harming your whole family every time you like put your foot down or grasp at something. So that makes total sense. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. I love that you just brought Shakespeare into this. This is awesome. Oh, man, that, is was, amazing. That, that was these worthy amazing, of a cocktail. Seriously, these elixirs, they just unlock the poet they heart. In all Hamlet is the, I'm glad <laughs> that I, so I went to school for acting and I'm glad that I had the foresight. I wanted to get the tragedy <laughs> comedy masks like on my pecs or my, my nice. biceps. I'm it's so glad that late. I didn't. It's never no, too it late, is. Nick. It, it's never the right time. Imagine yeah. what they would look like now, Nick. <laughs> Just, they'd all be sad. Both of them both would tragic. be sad. Yeah, both tragic. Both <laughs> <are proud. laughs> My kids would be like, why did you do both sad ones? I'm like, you don't understand. I even, I had a design Gravity that I wrote for Hamlet. Way. I would have like, 
I, I did like a, a weird conglomeration of Hamlet and I thought that would be a cool tattoo and it's not. I'm glad that I didn't do that. But it is the best, best play I ever written. It's amazing. Yeah, it's um, phenomenal. I wanted to ask, oh, um, the child that is in heaven. Uh, yes, in, yes. In which step of the process did that happen? And then, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is a wild, uh, a wild tale here. This is something, and it kind, of, it's, it kind of, it sits in the middle of what I just talked about, referencing IVF and the idea of grasping and using and then waiting for the gift. Um, in the middle of our infertility and praying and discerning, my wife heard this story of a woman in California, just Christian woman in California, who was on Dr. James Dobson's uh, Focus in the Family. She's listening to the radio show. And this woman was talking about IVF and how there's, you know, multiple embryos are often formed, fertilized, and that there's half a million frozen embryos, unborn children in our country alone, half a million. And uh, at the time, this was years ago, and uh, this woman said, I, I prayed to God and I thought like, you know, we should be adopting these unborn children at the embryonic level because they're just cryopreserved. Uh, there's going to be embryonic stem cell research. They'll be destroyed or just discarded or just frozen, locked in time. Like we, we need to reach out and save them. And so Dr. James Dobson's walking through this with her and like, wow, I never thought about that. Like they're children. They've been conceived via IVF. And most of the, you know, moms and dads who long for children, again, the intention's good, right? That they want children, but they're not often told the full story that you might have two dozen embryos for life so that you're going to have these children literally like in, in, in hyperspace, frozen indefinitely. So um, we learned about this adoption pro, it's called Snowflake's Embryo Adoption. Uh, because, you know, each snowflake is unique and unrepeatable and they're also cryopreserved, these children. So we prayed about it. We talked to uh, Dr. Janet Smith, Christopher West, uh, Dr. John Haas from the National Catholic Bioethics Center. I mean, we just like, wait, what is this? Do we, what is this? Uh, read up on church documents. And it was just such a fresh, hot thing. There's theologians kind of on both sides of it, but we got real support saying, you know, the, the, the act's been done, unfortunately, but these are lives, innocent human lives, unborn, frozen in time, literally. Uh, it's kind of do you feel called to it? And so Rebecca and I really prayed about that. And we welcomed Grace. Grace Elizabeth was frozen for years in a fertility clinic. We went, it's an adoption process, right? The, the genetic parents chose us. We adopted her. There was a transfer. She came to term, but she, she um, had something in utero called a crania. So her skull wasn't properly formed in the womb and she couldn't live outside the womb. So uh, we stormed heaven. We prayed to John Paul too. We had thousands of people praying. It was an amazing time of grace. Yeah. Hence, you know, we named her Grace Elizabeth. Yeah. She, so she was born and lived for 10 hours, uh, January 4th, 2009. I got to baptize her with my own hands in the uh, delivery room. It was, I mean, it was insane. And uh, she's our little saint in heaven. You know, she's not, she's no longer frozen in some fertility clinic she's free in the grace of god uh i got the baptizer which is nuts we have a saint in heaven right now and so that's why my my daughters sheila and and uh claire both have the middle name grace yeah for a little and we we raise awareness for so many people because nobody knew about this like what that's what ivf what that's what happens these children yeah. are um you know i i if anyone's oh. listening in and thinking oh my goodness you know it's it's certainly not something we uh it's very personal it's something that it was a prayerful journey. It's not for everybody, I would say. You know, it's such a delicate matter. But I mean, I mean, in our own way, with the grace of God, we became witnesses to these doctors and nurses and these fertility clinics who often have a very utilitarian way of looking at stuff. You know, like, oh, this this one doesn't look good. We're not going to transfer. We're like, these are children, yeah, and we're going to transfer them. You know, so it. We hope anyway. There was some witness to the sanctity of life in the whole, in the whole thing. Um, so to put a wow. pause on that, then would there be any, cause, so and I didn't know this. You didn't know this. We hadn't talked about this, but my wife and I, so we adopted three children and then didn't ever expect to be able to conceive. We were 15 years infertile and then conceived right. twice. So, but uh, Jacelyn, my wife since then has actually been looking, um, into like, well, okay, wow. what is, is it okay to adopt? Wow. We had no idea about snowflakes till you said the word just now, wow. because you and I have wow. never talked about it. So no, that's something a, I'm going to tell my wife, but also, um, like 
thank you for doing that, for, for taking that step. Cause it's even when it comes to adoption and, and you know, like that's a step, that's a step different than conception. It's a step. Uh, it's more concrete than just than conception. It's, it's, um, less enjoyable than conception at the outset. You know what I mean? Like it's, right. there's, there's right. no right. even intimacy. There's no physical intimacy at the beginning. It's just a, all right, I think we're going to do this. And, um, oh man, we have to choose. Okay. I think it's those ones, you know, like th- there's a, there's a very, um, I don't know, a very like realistic, it's more, almost more realistic feeling than just natural conception, which just shows up. That's you know, right. That's right. Very, so I, very, I would different. say, I would ask, is there anything we can put in the description below that would link them to whether it's snowflakes or any specific uh, resources for them regarding that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, this was, this was um, 12 years ago in our family yeah. story and I blogged about it. So I can certainly okay. send the links to the blogs that we wrote yeah. the whole journey. Where do um, you blog at? Well, I haven't blogged in many years, but it's missionmoment.blogspot.com. So I'm guessing you haven't blogged in many years because the ch- children came along. So <laughs> ding, 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 ding. My wife yes, and I have exactly. Nick, nickandjaislin.com. We were blogging the adoption process. And like a weekend, we're like, screw that. We just have to adopt these kids. Like, I don't have time to, to Seriously. blog about. Yeah. Nick, I haven't been on Facebook in like... 10 months, literally 10 months. I don't even do social media anymore. I'm like done. Yeah. I'm in the 20, the 20 feet around me is where I live. (laughs) That's That's my, I have real face time. (laughs) So, so, but I'm so, I'm so intrigued by your, your journey and, and that experience as so that's, I mean, like Nick, I've never heard of that. Um, And so as someone who's a TOB expert, you know, and I ask this question for anybody who might be, you know, swirling this around in their head. Yeah. Um, so you've, I've heard the objection uh, from, from people. And I know Christopher West has talked about this of, you know, come on, really, what's the difference between contraception and natural family planning? Right. Mm. And his response and, you know, John Paul, St. John Paul's second response is that there is a very clear distinction Oh, yeah. And so, so what you, what you're describing, it is IVF. And so my Not, thought or my, yeah. my, my, well, so, so, okay, great. Yeah. That, that kind of gets at the heart of my question, but because really yeah. the heart of the question is, you know, I would think, or, or many would think that the, the issue with IVF is the act of taking the sexual act out of conception, but conception right. has already happened. So right. you're right. only taking the sexual act out of implantation. We're rescuing a life. Yeah. yeah. You're adopting. We're, we're, yeah. we're rescuing, adopting a life. So, 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 IVF, so I guess my question is, can you, can you make that distinction for people? Yeah. Let's talk about it. Cause it's really important. Um, it's wild, Nick. We had no idea we we're going to go down this path, right? Because I, I know, and we can temper it. We don't have to go. You know, it's cool. But we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. but John Paul. So um, not John Paul, but um, you know, so so the sexual act is this amazing gift of God that images the fruitful love of God in the world, and it has that dual dimension, which everything Catholic is always the two in one, right? Everything yeah. is two in one: God and man, spirituality and sexuality, male and female, heaven and earth, um, form and matter. Like it's all twos. So the unitive and the procreative and what IVF does is it removes the unitive. And anytime we do that again, well-intentioned, right? Where what God has joined, let no one tear asunder. IVF is tearing asunder in vitro means literally in the glass. So a life is formed with a third party coming in a clinician, essentially forming a human life in a Petri dish. So, but the snowflake embryo adoption program is, is saying, and this is this is what's beautiful about the Snowflakes program, this Christian adoption agency. They're saying, please stop doing IVF. We don't want you to do this anymore. We're trying to save the the half a million plus unborn human children that have been conceived through IVF. Right? We're offering adoption because they exist. Okay, the act, and we'll say here, you know, the disordered or evil act has been done but the life is innocent. The life is good. Life is always good. So here we're going to say, uh, here's an opportunity for life. And that's what, that's what really snowflakes is all about. Um, IVF has been performed. This is a rescue operation. And again, I know that it's not, it's not for everybody. It's something to really pray about, but um, yeah. So, so if I hear you correctly, 
there is a clear moral distinction between IVF and, um, you know, making a wo- embry- and making a woman pregnant through an embryo that already exists. Because of the the intrinsic worth, the unrepeatable gift of this human life, which now exists. I mean, because think well, about it. Yeah, well, what are the alternatives? Yeah. Leave this child in cryopreservation for for decades, uh, and then no, kill it. That, like what? And then, yeah, and then yeah. kill it. Which is happening, right? There's this cleansing of of you know after a certain number of years, some clinics just wipe out the embryos. Or do do we uh, do embryonic stem cell research? So we kill which also kills it. Yeah, right. So so the, really, the only viable option is like an opportunity for life to rest well, your and, life. That's so this, I, I mean, this affirms the humanity of an embryo. Exactly. Like you're exactly. adopting a human. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Well, and that's, I, I had written that on my hand. Just, you just said, because they exist. And I think that's at the, at the core of, uh, right. I mean, that's at the core of all theology of the body, but all human life is just, like, oh, no, because they exist. That's where they, you know, because they that's are. It. That's it. And it, for me, in my head, that's always gone back to back when, um, the, the burning bush happens and God encounters Moses or Moses encountered God. And mm-hmm. he's like, well, okay, I'll do this, but who should I tell him has sent me? And he just said, just tell him I am, you know, I like love it. for me, yeah. that's always been like, I always joke. Like, I think at that point, God could have been like, tell them the God of vengeance is on his way. Like he could have <laughs> like, he could like the fire and brimstone. Like he could have done that, but he just, he just like almost like better than any action figure. He's just like, tell him I am. Like I exist and that's enough. And I think Seriously. us being in the image and likeness, like you're like, yeah, th- but they exist when we, so we had, we adopted three kids mm-hmm. and then Jason mm. got pregnant and we had this other one coming 15 and, years. And, <laughs> yeah. 15 years. Uh, yes. And everybody was really excited. Cause they're like, Oh my gosh, what? like you guys. We, mm-hmm. And so then Hudson came along. Well, th- that we're like, well, that's a one-off. That was fun. And then Evangeline came along and it was interesting to know when I told like, especially my grandpa, when I, because wow. none of the rest of my family is Catholic or anything like that. So they, it, there's a, I mean, life is good, but it's also different than the Catholic ethic. And so I told my grandpa, hey, grandpa, guess what? Like, Jason's having another baby. And he said, oh, Nick, why you got to keep having these kids? And I, so I was like, it's well, like grandpa, great. okay, out of the four that we have, which one do you like, Christian? He's like, oh, yeah. Do you like Esther? He's like, yeah. I'm like, do you? do you love Hudson or do you love Davy? Do you love Hudson? And uh, he was like, well, yeah. Why? I'm like, well, then you're going to love the next one just as much. Like what, which one of these would you not have wanted? One more can't do anything to that. And so like the idea that this, the, but cause you exist because, mm-hmm. because you are there. That's just actually just enough. If it's enough to, yeah. for God to identify himself that way, it's enough for us right. also to be like, well, yeah, because the child exists. Um, I always say that my mom had me when she was 17. She got pregnant when she was 17. And I always say, you know, she didn't, um, I, it wasn't that um, she wanted me because like, so I wasn't, I didn't have dignity or worth because she wanted me. She wanted me because I had worth. And it's like mm. a 180. Mm. It's a complete different, like she, mm-hmm. I came along at a time that wasn't good at all. Like it was an abusive time, right. a, a wayward time or whatever, but right. I just was. And so it had worth, like I had worth. So yeah, it's just so great that uh, because they exist, that's such a fundamental. Yeah, no, no, like seriously, Nick and Kevin. This is blowing my mind. Uh, like ser- we need to sit with this for a second because, and I, and I feel like this is John Paul II right now interceding because we're on the, the eve of his feast day. Oh, I'm serious. He, he, he is the apostle of human life. He's, he's the Pope of the family and the apostle of human life. And that's it. Like we need to sit in this for a second because I am, I exist. Yeah. Like you, you can make a holy hour just on those two, those two words. There's radiant power of that, that you exist. Right. And it should just like ripple out into the stinking cosmos. Like you're, we are immortal, unrepeatable human beings made in the image of God that cannot be destroyed. Right. Yeah. Never to pass away. L- I am. Ne- never to pass away. Even if we make morally evil, corrupt choices, we, you know, even if we're in hell, God forbid, ontologically in our being, in our core, we exist. That's amazing. And if we become saints, that's even more amazing. So I just feel like, yeah, like we, we, we need to sit in this. I am, I exist and just let it rock out into the world. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? Amazing. I, I'm just, now this is a quick flashback. I was just thinking of the Amy Coney Barrett hearings that happened last yeah. week. I guess it was last week. There's something about her. <laughs> she was a rock star, by the way. Nailed just her, her. She talked about radiant, radiant power. Like she yeah. just, 
I don't know how she kept straight. I would love to see. Uh, I'd love to see what's going on in her head every time. Oh, I know because you can't tell what's going on in her head. Because no, you she's can't. Just she's smooth. just she like the feminine the genius. Yeah, because she had the I am, and she's like, I don't need yeah. the Supreme Court. I'm a happy mother of seven and a wife. I'm good. I, I'm loved by God. I'm a daughter of the Father. I don't need any of this stuff. Well, and you and can the see pro it. death, everything coming at her. Like no, all the death, pro death. You're gonna rob. You're gonna kill millions. And she's just like, you have no idea the God of life. And I'm in his image. I'm just thinking of that's a moment of the culture. And like, you know, Diane Feinstein, the senator, right? She got rocked by that. At the end of those yeah. hearings, she was like, I've never been in a set of hearings like this. She hugged Senator Lindsey Graham. Yeah, what? dude. That I didn't know that. That has rocked the world. Yeah, she did. They and hugged. now some of the Democrats are saying, we want her out. <laughs> I mean, good. It, you can't even. It's like, yeah. but yeah. The, it's all about the I am, the beauty of yeah. life. The power of existence, which we all share in the three of us. Well, right it was now beautiful talking. because I've never watched a hearing in my life, but being a no, stay at home and having no career now, I watched every <laughs> minute of the, the whole confirmation <laughs> hearing. I did. And, and to be honest, for, so pause. I was very impressed after when you listen to media, I don't care which yeah. side it's, it's just such it's vitriol and anger and raw, un, like unrestrained, non self control, which is a gift of this or fruit of the spirit. To see them, even people on both sides who disagreed, it was really refreshing for me to see like they would still refer to each other by their title and there was just a restraint in it. But then to hmm. see her sitting there and like very, like vocally saying, like, no, I'm like, so many times she was like, no, I, I'm not coming for anybody. I don't have, I don't have right. an agenda. I, I right. just don't. And it was neat because for the first time, because she's not a politician, you could be like, no. And especially because she's such a firm Catholic, you'd be like, oh no, I get you. You don't have an agenda. You, uh, when she, when they try to twist, um, she was talking about uh, sexual preference and they try to twist it. They we're using the word oh preference. As effective. And again, like this, is, we, we try to stay non, you know, we're just right. up late, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, drinking. but to see her <laughs> turn around and be like, like with all humility, just be like, I, I never ever would want to offend somebody. Like to see yeah. that, that was, that was so good. It's like, Oh, so good. yeah, sincerely. And I, I don't think yeah. they could, they were, you know, she was sort of like Danielle in the lion's den, right? See what I did yeah. there? Danielle, yeah. Danielle in the lion's den. I see what you oh, hey, oh, yeah, hey. see it out. Yeah, man. It's, it's, it's the power, the power. <laughs> that's a, that's but, a bourbon and a half right there. <laughs> <laughs> but she, like, you can't, there's something irrefutable about it. Like the, right. the confidence. And I, you know, to bring it back to what we're talking about, our knowledge that life is good, that life is from God, that he's the creator, we're the creature. Uh, it's not on our shoulders. Like that can free us, liberate us, right? We have a sense of, um, even like a sense of humor, a sense of joy, which I'm not yeah. seeing. And I, I don't want to get political either, but there's a sense on the left, I, I hate labels, but there's a lack of joy. There's a lack of a sense of humor, right? Like we can laugh, we can have fun, we can have drinks and talk about the deepest things and then the most ridiculous of things. Because I think we have this sacramental vision that we can see through like, we're creatures. There's a father who loves us. And even though it gets crazy sometimes and there's all kinds of crosses we have to bear, it's going to be all right. Well, it's funny because um, I have a, I went to a Bible college. It was me and like a bunch of guys named Mike and we all went to school together. And for <laughs> whatever reason, or something? yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but um, <laughs> coming out of it, I'm the only one who stayed like in a conservative faith. Most people wow. are just out of faith. Wow. And it was interesting one night um, when me and actually the two boys, when we'd only ado adopted the two boys, we were traveling from Florida to Minnesota and we stopped in St. Louis because we needed a place to stay. My buddy lives there, Mike, um, and we stayed at his place <laughs> and he and I stayed up late just talking. And at one point, and I don't even remember the topic. I used to know the topic, but we were just, it started to escalate. We're going mm. back and forth, back and forth. And it, we both mm. love each other. Like he's, right. he's one of my most enduring friends. And it started to escalate. And at one point, and I don't have a lot of moments of clarity in my life. You can <laughs> tell that. But I had a moment where I just, I was about to launch back. And I just paused and I said, you know, Mikey, I'm sorry. I'm, mm. I'm not doing well at this at all. I'm not, I'm not relaying anything that I believe clearly. And he went, no, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm not. And it, it, it was this weird moment of wow. just like, we realized both of us 
what are we doing? Like, this is, we forgot humanity and, and all the, like, mm. we just became actual, like, Christian, anti-Christian talking points. And it kind of burst through that just by saying, like, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, it was, and it, it stuck with me forever. And I wish that, like, I think I saw a glimpse of it in seeing the confirmation hearings, although there was yes. venom, there was venom all over the place and a lot of oh, lies yeah. on both sides. But uh, there were there were just moments where, like, like you said, like, I didn't know that, um, what was Feinstein. her name? Who, yeah, Feinstein, that, Diane, Diane Feinstein. Yeah, yeah so. I didn't know that that happened. I didn't see that happen. It's but, amazing. Yeah. As, as, as at one point, at one point, Feinstein literally said to Amy Coney Barrett, "That's quite a definition. Thank you. I'm very impressed." Like those words came out of her mouth. Yeah, and cool. it was it was just so so amazing. Where it was like I don't know who said this, but you know, to to win any argument, you need to like keep your s together and know yeah, ten yeah. times more than the, than your opponent and it's so clear that she's not full of pride. Like she didn't need to impress anybody. She just knew so much more than the people who are asking her. Well, and getting back to the, I am she, she didn't even need to, her family was there. They were on display. She didn't even, you could tell she wasn't resting in the fact that she had a good family and a husband who loved her. She just knew the, I am she's like, no, I'm okay. Like just, it was all so peaceful. It was amazing. Isn't it wild though? I'm thinking right, right now, just as we're talking that, uh, all we're talking about is like basic human kindness and civility, which <laughs> is like, that should be like, surprising. Shouldn't we get this? It's 2020. Should we have figured this out by now? Like, but yeah. that's, that's how far we've fallen. I think is that we just, I mean, in this age of, of just so much unhinged, being unhinged from reality, disconnected from everybody, staring at phones more than people, not yeah. really like engaging other people. It's like, Oh yeah. Basic human kindness. I can learn from you, right? The, one of my favorite quotes, St. Columban, he said, uh, a life unlike your own can be your greatest teacher. That's awesome. Like, I, I try to live by that, right? Like, who are you? What's your story? What's up? I don't, I don't want to hear your labels. I don't want to see, like, I'm driving behind a car and they got all the bumper stickers on it. And it's like, uh, you just boxed yourself. I don't want to look at your bumper stickers. I, just like, let's go grab coffee <laughs> and have a conversation. And, well, and uh, I found that's what we life- need today having become ha- having become catholic late in life um because i'm of advanced age i and I you're dying found, yeah you're not yeah, at the advanced stage i'm dude i'm 42 i'm older than just, you we're just stop can you reference the gray just don't. Uh, if i'm allowed to reference it i have told my wife multiple times in my life i wish i would go silver i want to go silver so <laughs> bad when yeah. we so i have blonde hair i i'm when we moved to the Caribbean without children, I had almost bleachy blonde hair, but very golden blonde hair. And then uh, we adopted children. And instead of the golden, going gray that I always wanted to do, when it we just got went dishwater on you, man. No, when we got back to America, I had three separate people at three separate times in three separate states take me aside and be like, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to like make waves, but why are you dyeing your hair? I was like, what do you mean dyeing my hair? Like, yeah, your hair got all dark. You're like, you have brown hair. I'm like, no, that's just stress of, do you see the children and what they're doing right now? Like, that's- You're like, that, it's like so, the Benjamin I'll, Button story. You're going backwards. Going backwards, your hair's going to be jet black when you're yeah, sitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah all like, wavy and stuff. Oh, wow. I would, well, I would love your hair. I don't you know, know how we got on Some people would be envious. No, I don't either. You had a deep thought coming and then we just got sidetracked. Ah, yes, sorry. Age. It was going to be going? amazing. What was it that was. thought you had? Let's just pretend it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. What were I, we talking about? That. Something yeah. amazing. Well, and that's, I think that's at the core of so much is right now, especially, especially with the zombie apocalypse, how everybody is, <laughs> everybody is going through a microphone, through a screen, through the internet. Yes. It's yes. so, it's easier now to be reactionary than ever before. And you oh, can yeah, do instantly. it instantly and mass the whole world you can put something out there and the whole world knows your reaction before you have time to temper it you know what i mean i I, and i don't i am not commenting one way or another on the president but i did see an interview with him where somebody asked him like your tweets you know do you do you do you like um do you regret any of it and he he said uh yeah yeah, I do a lot of it. In fact, it's the retweets. It's the retweets in the middle of the night where I see something and I click it and it's out there. And then somebody's like, Oh, did you see that hat in the background or whatever? Like, I think that ability right now for every human to be like, Pope said what? And then we yeah, could like, yeah. we could record two hours worth of content and shoot it yeah. out there. Um, 
I think it is better to, to shut up and, yes. and to, to give it time, you know, like the yeah. church has like historically done just like, okay, pump your brakes, just take it easy. Like you, yes, there's no need right. for it. And actually for you, like us three in the room, there's no need for anyone to know our opinion right now. Like, like it's so inconsequential. No, no, nor, in nor is there a need. Thank you, Nick. Right. And, yeah. and Kevin, for raising this point, nor is there a need for us to, um, freak out about every single thing that's that's been said by the pope again again he's in a it was a documentary movie i we just in our crazy news cycle of 24 7 right uh, we we don't you know what are we going to do listen to what did he say when he had coffee you know in the breakfast the other day like is that ex cathedra is that have the same weight so you know again is it confusing yes it's confusing it's it's troubling but deep breath Social media, I mean, I really do. You know, remember Y2K? This was 20 years ago. Y2K, like the year 2000, I thought computers were going to like fry and die. I was like, I wish they would, would have. Be, I, I, exactly. I'm like, that would have been awesome. Can somebody do that right now? Save like everything. the modern day flood. I, I, seriously. You know, and I say that we, we need to stay. And this is why I've jumped off. I literally haven't been on social media since January 1st of this year. There's a lot oh. behind that. But I, I, just, I just let it all go. And I was very active every day, you know, sharing the, the true, the good, the beautiful, the faith. But I've just jumped off of it. And it's like, we need to stay in the 20 feet that surround us, loving our wife and children, loving the person before me, you know, ministering to people in need. It's just, it's, it's too much. It's, it's actually an inhuman, like flicking through our screens and reading all these stories and all these experiences, and like just this roller coaster ride of emotions. And it's like, how am I going to affect change there? It's coming at us. It's like a digital gluttony. We're just like, rah, rah, rah. we're just gobbling at all these tweets and retweets and Facebook posts. And it's digital gluttony. Take a mm. fast. Take and a break. Work. Nick, that Love hits on a neighbor. documentary. That hits on the documentary you were yeah. just talking about. Go ahead. I don't yeah. even remember what it's uh, called. Oh, The Social, the social Dilemma. dilemma. Yeah. I, <laughs> I've got to see that. I've been hearing great stuff about that. Oh, man. It's, it's, it nails it's it. literally conditioning us. Yeah. It's so Bad. funny because like from a TOB point, like point of view, the social dilemma and childhood 2.0, like they just hit it. They, but the problem is they're the after effect. They're, they're like going like, oh, look what's been done to us as, as people, as spirit body composites. Look, look what we've kind of submitted to. And right. I think that, the, so they're, they're a bit react. The social dilemma is amazing. I, everybody should see it. Although it's on yeah. Netflix. And so it's so funny because the whole, the yeah, whole I just got rid of Netflix. Yeah. yeah the whole watch. documentary yeah. is about how bad social media is and you have to pay for Netflix to get it. Right. Plus so, we're zooming yeah. right now and you're going to probably like put this on <laughs> Facebook. Uh, whatever. Yeah. You but too. yeah, the point is, I, I but, think the point is like, we have to, you know, Dr. Peter Crape says this, right? The, these things are neutral tools, yeah. right? Yeah. But you, you got to possess your possessions. Don't be possessed by your possessions. And that's what's happening. We're possessed. We have Pavlovian responses to the pings, the likes, the re- And it's like, no, you're a human person. Back yeah. to the I am. You're an unrepeatable, unique person. Made the image of God that will outlive all of this. You will outlive the universe, right? Yeah. So just, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a flash fire. It's just, it's nothing. It's a blip. It's a things. vapor. Yeah. Literally. Well, and yeah. the other thing is, and I like that the social media or the social dilemma brings that in, but we, we are not, we are not evolved to handle the onslaught. Like we're not no. mate. We're not supposed to handle the onslaught of every opinion of every human who can launch it at us with a click, with just saying return, you know, like with publish, like you're, we haven't advanced. We're not able to handle that. We're not supposed no. to, but yet no. that's where we are right now. And the church is experiencing the same thing. Pope Francis, I don't know him. I, I've never met him. I, I will right. never meet him. And, <laughs> and but yet it's so easy to be like, he did what? Son yeah. of a biscuit. Are you kidding me? Like, I just, I just think that, yeah, like, like just pump your brakes. Uh, and like you said, unplug yeah. might help. Don't unplug yeah. from the show, obviously, but like, unplug clearly. From everything else. Yeah. And please like, and share with your friends, subscribe here, smash that it, like no, button. Like, no, I, I'm smash all about <laughs> we are, it's the whole thing. Again, the amount of content coming at us from all sides. Yeah. It, it It's inhuman. It moves at an inhuman Right. Juggernaut it is speed. Inhuman. It is not human. Like, because, and then when you actually get a break and you like, you know, I try to make a thing of getting up at 5.30 in the morning before the kids wake up and I get my prayer time, sit in the chair, dark roast coffee, 
yeah. you know, bird song, sun's coming up. If, if that feels like, oh, this is so weird. I got to, I got to check my, then you, you, you're an addict. You got a problem. Yeah. You, you need to be able to slow down to the solemn, majestic sunrise, which takes a solid hour, right? <laughs> the pre-dawn game show, like watch the whole thing unfold. Take a deep breath. What's the weather of the day? Feel it. Be an embodied person. You know, we just, we're, we're wrecking ourselves, I think. We're trashing our humanity because we just, it's coming so fast and we have to slow down, slow down slow down and build these like motor skills. You know, we don't know how to do that. Like little two-year-old kids are like flipping through iPads. Yeah, I know. They're already genius at it. Oh, take that thing away. That's child yeah. abuse. What are you doing? <laughs> they need to have their hands in the dirt, right? They need to have their hands in the, in the creek, finding crawdads and flipping stones over. They have to get in touch with reality before they start touching screens all the time. And I don't get me going. I'll need another. another well, I know it's weird. I grew up, I grew up in the woods of Northern Minnesota outside of Duluth. Awesome. It just, awesome. we, we had 80 acres of swamp and woods and oh, man, none of awesome. us grew up with social media. There's no, there were no cell phones or anything. And nope. I remember my mom just being like, I'm going to lock the door. I will see you in five <laughs> hours. I'll see, I, you'll be okay. I'll see you in five hours. And we would just be gone. And it was weird because I never thought of it again. I didn't know that was formative. And then we adopted kids and suddenly we have these children who are like in the house, just mm. standing by me. And I remember my wife said, my wife always said, I don't remember ever wanting to be near my parents. Like what, why, no. why do they want to? And I, it's because they, I, so we have, we have our lawn, uh, which is four and a half acres out here in the wilderness. Awesome. And then it gets a little taller, which is city property, but it's still outside city limits. And then there's woods. And I can't tell you the amount of times I've told my kids like, do you see where I can't see you anymore? Go there. Like, get out of here. <laughs> and all three of them, and I have a picture of it somewhere. My kids walked off of the mowed grass into the tall grass, not the woods. Yes. And then they yes. stood there for 30 minutes, just kind of talking to each other at the edge of mowed grass. Oh and I'm like, gosh. I guess I'm a failure, I guess. Because, <laughs> like, I don't, what, why don't you want to go far? Why don't you want to run away? Like, run Wait, away so why? Why don't they? And why do I don't you? Know. Like, what's different? We, we limit, the kids get 30 minutes a day. That's all they get. It doesn't matter. They get 30 minutes a day in front of any form yep. of screen other than like yep. weekends when we do family movies. But like, yep. and it still, it hasn't mattered. Somehow they're like, well, I'm scared to go out there. I'm like, what? I don't know. It's weird. Nick, we're the same. We're the same. We have, the same <laughs> we have, we have, we have essentially the same limitations. Yeah. And every, every weekend, every weekend, we just did it last weekend. I get them into the wild. I'm like, go get your walking sticks. Let's flip some stones, find stuff. Um, and they love it. They'll complain though, but they'll complain. They're like, oh, no, no. and when they get out into the wild, they love it. But yeah, there's this weird, like I had the same thought, Nick, as you did. I, like, I don't remember my dad at all. Like <laughs> he was no. working. I was yeah. riding my bike. I was playing baseball. I came home at nine thirty. Yes. I, I like yeah. came in, I grabbed a sandwich and I ran back out for four, four more hours. I, I would be gone. I was two miles dad. away. I'd come home yeah. oh, on our dirt gone. road and my mom would be like, why are you here? And I'd be like, cause I'm <laughs> hungry. And she's like, just go. And then we'd be gone. And <laughs> yeah, it's love. weird because that Feel was somehow love. like, it was somehow intrinsic to us of just, and again, like if you grew up in a city and you're listening, like it's not a diss on growing up in a city. Cause I love right. the city. The city is full of adventure. That'd be like, it's True. just something is different now. Something about the accessibility. Yeah. And I like what you said. It's that like a human, you can say like, but I exist. I'm here. I'm in this. Like, this is, I, I have a spirit body composite, but this is not a thing. Like this is not a human, like the screen that I'm looking mm -hmm. at is it's not real. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's in, so, I, I say that all the, all the time about porn. Like the biggest oh. thing about it is like, but that's not real. Not, no. not one aspect is real. None of it's real. No. Um, no. At least the way it's portrayed. And I think our generation or our kids generation uh, is really struggling with that to be like, well, but, okay, but why should I, when I can see everything here on the screen, why should I go out there? Um, but like you said, I think after about, I, I give it 60 minutes, I tell them like, I, I don't want to see you for 60 minutes. And usually about 40 minutes, they sit on the doorstep, just huddled together, like playing with a rock. But then after about that time, they do, they branch out, they're gone. I have to call for them. And like, it starts to, they become human, I guess is what happens. But 
Yeah. And, and and it is it's not locale it is it is generational yeah. i grew up in the big city and what you guys are describing was the exact same thing i w- i experienced just gone from after wow. breakfast until awesome. dinner my i saw awesome. my dad for a half hour in the morning and then he came home for dinner and he had dinner and then after dinner it was we were playing but you know something and then getting ready for bed it's like it, it, it i mean it just resonates exactly what you guys are saying Oh, it's, it's that spirit it's, of, of adventure, right? And confidence. It builds it. You, you start realizing you're uh, called into deeper, wider relationships with the world. And the, the danger of it is, is kind of a thrill. My, my step, uh, not my stepfather, my father-in-law, my wife's father, Arthur, he grew up in, I think it was Queens. There, there are stories of him when he was like 11, 10 years old. He would like get on the train and just go like for six hours. Yeah. He'd just get on a train. 10-year-old kid <clears throat> just traveling on yeah. a train somewhere. And then they like get on the train, go back the opposite direction, and go back home again. It's like, hey, mom, can you imagine that yeah. today? Like people no. call cops, SWAT teams, helicopters. Like, well, there was that <laughs> mom years ago. She got in, she was she was known for a while, like a, a, for a news cycle, as the worst mom in America. They lived yes. in Manhattan, and she she wrote a book called Free Range Children. I don't know if you heard about her. She's amazing. No. She's really fun to listen to. But Your she mom. would send her nine year old on the subway to school. And she was like, I don't understand what the problem is. Um, I taught my nine-year-old how to get there. It's fine. And so C- like CBS or ABC had her on as like this horrible Gosh. example. But then a, 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 like a groundswell happened because people were like, wait, you can do that? Like you can, mm. you can like grow them and teach them? You can teach your kid a thing? <laughs> a thing to do? <laughs> yeah. What? Why what? are you serious? <laughs> my kid would walk up to me and be like, I want some chips. And I'm like, well, you're going to starve to death because they're two feet away in this cupboard and <laughs> just open the freaking door. But I, I wanted to pause Starts for a second. Generation. And um, this, have you ever seen this book? Oh my gosh, I love that book. I have that book for my kids. Oh, and I got that yeah. for my, uh, my godson. Awesome there, book. There's a, a awesome. one for girls as well. Cause yes, the daring book for why girls. Not? Yep, it's awesome. Yeah, the daring book for girls and the dangerous book for boys. Yep. It, it's filled with just miscellaneous. It's filled with like the Navajo code talkers alphabet. Like there's, right. and my son Davey, like he reads it and you can see like adventure begin when yes. he'll read on it and stuff. Yes, and I, I get, book. which is better. Like uh, he was earlier asking, like, Dad, can I listen to Audible and do an audiobook? I'm like, no, because I got this for you a couple of years ago and now you can read. So just, just dive in but then after just a while turn just, it yeah can i swipe the pit yeah oh they wait swipe. how do i how does it go Where oh my gosh this? oh my <laughs> gosh <laughs> yeah just yeah, i, I don't think, go ahead go ahead no kevin go ahead i was just going to say something dismal about the end of western civilization as we know it so you go yeah kevin oh, you okay <laughs> oh yeah definitely then. <laughs> my, my's the opposite and um you just really briefly my my oldest son is six and he is a master of adventure. I mean, it is insane. The things that he's into and these are his teacher at school is like this kid. I, this kid is amazing. I mean, he just, he has a, we, he has a worm farm in our basement right now. And he got has, worms. I mean, he it's caught, exciting. he, he Good caught violent. spiders by the hundreds this summer, just mm-hmm catching spiders and feeding wow. them to each other. And this, like, he just, he caught so many crawdads, Bill, so many crawdads. Yes, he this did. Summer. <laughs> yeah. I just, and it like, it makes me feel more alive. Oh yeah. You get thrilled. You get the thrill, right? I got to yeah. share something real quick. Cause we're on this vein. Yeah. Here. I don't know, yeah, how, do long, it. I don't know how long, I don't know how long we're going, but this is awesome. I'm this really two hours. It's like a Joe Rogan experience. So we have, we have a wow. hour left. Wow. Did you know that Matt Fred does like three hour pod? He's nuts. It's too long, man. Way, it's too long. It is too long. But by the way, Matt Fred did have some great um, content today. Back to he the did. I watched it. I watched it. What, yeah. what was that? Yeah. Regarding what was Francis. He, he spoke for 24 minutes after the Pope Francis headline. Uh, okay. Exploded. It was off the cuff too. And it was beautiful. It was off the cuff, really sensitive, really like, you know, he could, you know, a lot of, a lot of, it was very beautiful. Prayerful, check that out. thought through. Yeah, he did a great job. But anyway, why don't I just say that? Well, yeah, I want to share this. You had an anecdote. Yeah. Yeah. We've got our kiddos and we're talking about like the return to reality, coming back to our senses, um, being human again. Uh, a couple, it was, I guess, two summers ago, I um, connected with Dr. Brian Moran, Duran, Duran, D-O-R-A-N. And he's up in Canada, Ontario, Canada. 
and uh, no, no, Alberta. And he has a camp, a summer camp for boys called Arcathios. Have you guys heard of Arcathios? Mm. Holy. For one week, we lived completely unplugged in like, like the amazing Canadian wilderness uh, of Alberta. And it was literally like a Lord of the Rings, full on live role playing adventure. I mean, it was mm. insane. And boys from eight years old up to there was levels actually. There was levels of bo- young, young boys, teen boys, young adults, and dads. What's it called? I went there and I, uh, oh, Arcathios. Oh my gosh! Okay, we'll it put it in the so, link below. Yeah, it was so good because it was this whole thing of getting boys immersed in the real world again, like in in creation, in the beauty of it all, adventures every day, um, uh, like role playing into like almost Lord of the Rings kind of adventures. So you discovered that. Uh... Uh, a couple of years ago, you said, Arcathios? Yeah, I kind of stumbled on it and then uh, connected with Brian. He reached out. He knew I was doing theology and body work. So I actually did talks for the fathers. There was There's fathers that are at the camp as well with their sons. And I did some theology of the body talks with them out in the, like, under these huge tall pine trees in the woods. It was awesome. Um, and then I did some some talks with the boys, the teenage boys. And I actually played a character. I was I was one of the characters in this like story. I mean, they've got like a castle built in the middle of the woods, uh, incredible stuff, full on battles, like dozens of boys in epic battles with each other, catapults. I mean, it was literally. I felt like I was in a movie. There's at the end of the week. There's literally like a um, the field of Cormallan, siege of Gondor, Lord of the Rings battle with like swords. I mean, the guy like some of the dads are dressed like orcs, and I mean legit costumes like real swords leather you know like armor and we're in the middle of it i'm like am i in a mood what is happening right this is awesome but uh it's a life changer because the kids and then they connected to the catholic faith they connected to the spiritual adventure so uh it was just really cool i'd never seen anything like it he's doing a great job up there if you're both lord of the rings fans i need to show you something real quick oh yeah okay so i Oh my gosh. So I have been a fan of Lord of the Rings and I, I've read it to my boy. My boy, I still remember the moment when Seth was probably eight years old. I've been reading Lord of the Rings to him from the book before the movies. I always read the book before the movies. Got to do it. Read the book before the movies. And I'm reading about the um, Gandalf the White returns, right? In, uh, and he was like holding his bed. It was like 930 at night. He's holding his bed. She's like, and when he realizes it's Gandalf the White Return, he leaps off the bed, flying at me in total joy, like unhinged, like, yeah, and like lands on me. So I have a leather bound edition of the Lord of the Rings. Oh. That, uh, you guys, like this is literally, I had a guy from Italy make this for me. It is, it, it was literally handed to me by Bilbo Baggins. Gold leaf like marbleized it's it's illustrated it's insane and uh i will send you I'll put it in the show notes that is beautiful this is the stuff like this is the stuff that um talk about like incarnational reality and theology of the body and epic story and adventure like this stuff um dude I mean, you I, just I, yeah just putting it in your hands like it it's inspiring. Like <laughs> it just it just wells up feelings inside of it. Does. It does. And the smell of leather. I mean, it's that's also like a sacramental to me. <laughs> but that's the thing I want people to realize, like about our faith. It's so it's so real. And the Lord baptizes everything, right? Like all the stuff that moves you, that gets you excited. I mean, I love the fact that we're drinking old fashions, you know, like we're we're in touch with our senses, we enjoy a good laugh. Um, people need to know this, like, right back to the Amy Coney Barrett thing. Remember they had all the women on the Supreme court steps dressed as the handmaidens or whatever it was thinking that Catholicism is like this puritanical repressive, like you guys have no idea what you're talking about. This is life lived to the full, right? Mm -hmm. It is the spiritual adventure and, uh, Mm -hmm. dang it. We got to proclaim that from the rooftops, right? Brothers. We do. You know, you talked about, um, at that, uh, that camp how your son just kind of unleashed and they're dirty and they're (laughs) laughing and it just makes me wonder if you know 300 years ago in scotland or england or united states that people laughed a lot like when people got together was there a lot of laughter um i've i've been at those family functions where 
people are just vibrant and joyful and laughing. And I wonder if that was just commonplace when people gathered before the age that we're in now. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's true because there's just, there's a simplicity. And when you have simplicity and you have an uncluttered life, um, you, you, just, you just see more clearly. And you see, like I was saying before, you, you have that sacramental vision that you see through things and you know, you, you believe in a loving God and you can laugh, you can laugh it off. So you don't take things so seriously. Like here we are freaking out with this pandemic with masks and fear. We have this unhealthy fear of death, which PS is coming to 100% of the human population. Everybody's going to die. But as Catholics, you know, and I think that's why people did laugh in the past. I mean, they made up ridiculous, like read some of those nursery rhymes from the, you know, ashes to ashes, we all fall down. They're all about death and the plague. Like it's creepy, but they were free because they had faith so they could laugh even in the face of tragedy. Like it's okay. It's going to be okay. There's a thing, I think it's called the Ars, Ars Moriandi, the art of death or the, the memento mori, right? The remember death. Which, which we've just, we've just lost. Like, I don't want to do that. But it was, it's an art, like the art. Peter Craved again, he, he talked about like death is, what is death? Death is Cinderella's coach coming to take us to the ball, right? Like that's what death is. St. Francis called it Cinderella, uh, called it um, sister death. Like it's part of life and it's going to be okay because he's conquered death. Like, that's so cool. And you know, like intellectually hear the words, but then like it trickled down to your heart. Like, I am free. I am free. I have nothing, literally nothing to fear, which is so hard for us today because of the fear climate everywhere. And not, not to get political again, but it seems like on one side, there's just nothing but fear, gloom and doom and fear. And the other side, it's like, it's, you know, it's, I mean, Donald Trump is one thing, but just the, the almost the frivolity like he couldn't he couldn't care less right he couldn't care less <laughs> but but uh, I, I feel like um that's got to be our witness right that's got to be our witness that it's gonna be all shall be what's Julian of Norwich right all shall be well all shall be well in all things all shall be well do you believe this or not like seriously do you believe it or not I, I gotta share this real quick my dad my dad is my rock my dad's my rock star and he's a rock he's 72 years old now He's like uh, living like a hermit up in the woods of Maine. And um, when I was 15, my parents divorced. My dad, he, he just, he really fell apart. Like he wanted the, the marriage to come back. The family was falling apart. And he's just, he had a whole reversion to his faith. Suffered like two major strokes at the age of like 38 years old. I remember carrying him down the hallway. He was like, his whole left side was out. But um, our lady grabbed his heart. He came back. Uh, he got stronger. But he had he had been brought so down to his knees that when he he kind of came back, he used to say stuff like, and, and he had the freedom, right? He was just like, kiddo, as long as you got toilet paper and you're in the state of grace, what else do you need? <laughs> that's like the core. Oh, that's going on. Yes. That's, that's it's literally going on the funeral card, like when he dies, whenever that might be. You know, as long as you're in the state of grace and you have toilet paper, what else do you need? But that's that's the freedom, <laughs> right? That's the freedom that Christ has set us free. He has truly set us free. And when that goes from the head into the heart and the bones, and, and it really takes takes seat in your being, you're like, then you become attractive, right? I think you become like this magnetic person because you have such, such freedom. It's radiant. And, and people are like, what the, wow, what's going on over there? And you know what, Nick and Kevin, I want to dedicate it to my man, John Paul too. This, this mug is covered in quotes of John Paul the Great. This, as we're recording this episode, we are uh, on the, it's the vigil. Actually, is it after midnight where I am? Yeah. Sweet. It is the feast of John Paul the Great. All right. He is my mentor. So He's my perfect. spiritual father. So to John Paul, Carol Wojtyla, Pope of the family, apostle of the human person, and prophet of the civilization of love and life, may he pray for us, pray for our culture and our church and our world that we taste and see the Lord is good and the gospel is good news and we are free. We are truly free to John Paul too. Cheers. It was sweet. Great Play to meet you, Bill. Me. You too, Kev. I'm looking forward to coming back. This is a lot of fun. A lot of Can't fun. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>